It's Dave Lawrence, member-supported Hawaii Public Radio, HPR One, and All Things Considered. Dave Windorf, principal, songwriter, guitarist, vocalist of Monster Magnet, Cobras and Fire, the Mastermind Redux, latest album from them. It's a real pleasure to welcome him to All Things Considered. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. <laughs> What's up? Nice name. You're in Jersey today? Yep. I'm right. in beautiful New Jersey. So it's not the first reimagining, but if you can explain the concept. Well, anybody who releases something like, say, like a movie or a or an album. There's always uh, several different ways to present the music, but because of deadlines and because of commercial considerations and all that stuff, you do what you do. In the modern age, starting with uh, director's cuts on DVDs, I just kept thinking, I was like, well, why don't I just go back, take stuff apart, fiddle with it, go completely berserk. And that's what I decided to finally indulge myself in that concept. When you get a DVD that's, say, a director's cut of Jaws, we'll just put any movie in there. Even if they've added a few things to it, in general, it ends up an extended version of Jaws. But... For myself, at least, Mastermind is uh, close to unrecognizable in this. And yet, can you talk about the re-recording process and how much of the actual record you used? Yeah, it's insane. And you're right. I'm, I shouldn't say director's cut. This is like, it's like I just stripped off the flesh off a skeleton <laughs> and then started putting the flesh back on. So is it the original? Kind of. On this particular record, I listened back to Mastermind, which was done in a hurry and done with a, a co-producer. And I was like, hey, it's just too stock. It could have been more eccentric and odd. And that's the way I've been getting lately in my life, you know, so... I did things really, really my way in a very, very homegrown style, like recording in my hometown and walking down the block to the studio, and I'd spend like four hours or 12 hours. All I was looking to do was to gain an atmosphere out of each of those songs with any kind of mu music I could get, lo-fi or hi-fi, any instrument, and just take the lyrics of the song and listen to them and say, what kind of music does it need? It doesn't have to be a rock song or whatever. Set up a bunch of instruments like organs and old Mellotrons and all kinds of cool old stuff, little cheesy amplifiers, you know, things that were broken, and just said, all right, I'm going to try this. Nope, yes, nope, yes. Boom. All right, good. That's <laughs> odd. That sounds good. And that was the way I treated it. What's probably attracted many people to the magnet, stylistically, the use of the retro gear. Not a lot of people do. It's a very eccentric kind of form. Every technology has a sweet spot. And I really think musical instruments and sounds, my personal opinion, hit a sweet spot somewhere around between 65 and 75. I love those sounds, and I was like, that's going to be my vocabulary. Started getting those old instruments and started off with very few. You own them or do you rent them? I'll do whatever I can. I, I own some, but if I need to rent them, like I remember Dopes to Infinity, I rented so much old stuff. The waveforms are different. You know, just to get musically techy about the whole thing, older guitars with the old pickups and fuzz boxes and amps and stuff, they aren't as consistent as new stuff. You have to fight them to get the sound. It's in that struggle of this kind of off-again, on-again, subtly wavering forms is where, when you put them all together, becomes this sound that you can't replicate with modern stuff because the modern stuff is just so damn good. There's a certain flatlining that happens when everything's perfect. It's like working with too many computer plugins. Everything's so direct. It's like what happens to you when you listen to too much electronic dance music and you go from being, wow, this guy's the next Mozart to next... <laughs> You know, I mean, in a second. You do it in a second, you know? This is the coolest thing I've ever heard. And then a second later, you're like, turn it off. <laughs> you can't get through the tune. You it, can't get through the tune, in my opinion. It's because it's all these similar frequencies going. <laughs> Kids love it because it's right in your face. You don't have to try. So I love the struggle of getting these old instruments together and making them work. I don't know anything about anything. I just pick up something and bang on it until it sounds cool. That would throw anyone who knows your music off because... It doesn't seem randomly put together at all. To me, it's all about how one instrument fits with the other. And uh, more as I get older, I try to get more power from the combination of instruments and less from, like, one booming giant instrument. Stylistically, it's so authentic. It's oh, so dude, original. Like, totally made my whole day. I mean, I, I don't know if people are listening. I'm like, what am I doing You know, at the end of it? I'm like, oh, why did I do that? 12 hours a day, unplugging and plugging stuff in, going, no, yes, it doesn't matter. But if you say it, and like, just you 
you mention that? It makes me so happy. Let me zero in on a song, Watch Me Fade. The organ lines, who's doing that? That is a guy from Long Branch, New Jersey, named Jeff Levine. Been playing organ forever. He's about, like, you know, 15 years older than me. Had him come over, and I was like, play it like this. There's a very distinct difference in styles within this seemingly one style, six, quote unquote, 60s sound, you know? And I'm like, nope, that's too strawberry alarm clock. Let's go more for Alan Price and the animals. And he knew it. And he went for the Alan Price part and it made the song come alive. Who is it that you love so much as a singer? I listen to my older brother's records with like Stones and the Beatles. But my first records were like Sabbath and Zeppelin and Pink Floyd, Sly and the Family Stone. Everybody was singing kind of different. The one thing I, I did appreciate, everybody sang a kind of a bluesy thing. I thought that was what you're supposed to sing. When I finally did get into a band, I think it was like 18 or 19, we did covers. This was like 1975 or 1976. So it would be one song by Sabbath, two songs by UFO, one song by Lou Reed, two songs by the Stooges, one song by Hawkwind, all these different bands. So I had to sing all those different ways. <laughs> and all that stuff that I could pull off wound up in my voice. No Paul Stanley? Yeah. I mean, there is Paul Stanley. I can hear it. Even I don't even want it. <laughs> you know, I, I've heard that before. I'm like, that sounds like Paul Stanley, dude. When you start hearing that vocals in your head and you're singing in the shower or whatever, and it sounds somewhat like it when you're all by yourself, you're like, this is amazing. <laughs> this sounds kind of like that. I can do that. <laughs> you never forget it. I think over the years, you just kind of make a bag of tricks. It's a great bag of tricks. Singing is good for you. Singing is like a good thing for people to do, whether you get paid for it or not. Get in that room with nobody in there or go to karaoke or something, but it'll set you free. It's kind of like moving, dancing uh, with the rhythm. Yeah. There's a release that's good for you psychologically and spiritually. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like exercising, but like cool exercising. You have a, um, a thing about doing covers. And the one on the new record, when The Temptations came out with Ball of Confusion, that was a somewhat unusual song for them. Psychedelic the... soul. Yeah. Can you think of anything cooler than that? I mean, soul and funk and R&B is a huge part of my life. I mean, it was like right next to Sabbath. It wasn't a problem for me as a kid to buy There's a Riot Going On by Sly and the Family Stone and School's Out by Alice Cooper on the same day. The thing about Ball of Confusion that gets me is like songwriters and arrangers at the top of their game. Of course, I didn't use any of that arrangement, but um, <laughs> was the fact that it was Psychedelic Soul, which was new. What? We're going to put LSD in The Temptations? This is insane. <laughs> but the subject matter of the song is not a boy meets girl song. It's this existential, yep. almost like a, like a news, like a freak out, an absolute yeah. freak out. Like, ah! It's a ball of confusion. And that's what it was. Lyrically, it could be from today. And it sure could. Lyrically, it's like it was written today. This world is so crazy. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons. And I had a jam that was done during Mastermind. I just asked Phil to play a Lemmy-style Hawkwind thing. And Bob to um, play in a Hawkwind style, like four on the floor kind of thing. And I would just hold down a guitar just because I wanted to hear it. I was like, maybe I'll, I'll do some psychedelic stuff over it later. And then when I took it out to reimagine it, I sat down and listened to it. And I oh, what the hell am I going to do with this? But for some reason, the way these earworms get you, I just kept hearing all of confusion. This is going to be a Hawkwind version of Hawkwind Pink Fairies, Monster Manic version of Bowl of Confusion. What you just said captures another part of the essence of the band. You have this jammy kind of quality about Magnet. I mention it because when you talk about doing Ball of Confusion and jamming it, the version of Evil is Going On by legendary blues man Willie Dixon. Simple song like that. To do what you did, there's also a level of education. It's like you're doing a community service when you take that man's <laughs> song. Seriously. Thanks, dude. You know, it's it's fun to do. There's a way to jam out without destroying the whole structure of the song, and that's really the major thing. When does it go from completely demolished song structure, and then it just becomes like Ornette Coleman or something? You know? <laughs> um, but but it, it's to get the jammy feel and the feeling of, um, of exploration in the music without destroying the structure. You do it, Dave. Thank you so much. I mean, it really makes me feel good that someone actually is listening. Awesome, dude. It's Dave Windorf, Monster Magnet, Cobras and Fire, the Mastermind Redux, and it's out. It's in stores. Really appreciate you being part of member-supported Hawaii Public Radio and all things considered with me, Dave. And congrats on doing an incredible record. Oh, thank you very much, Dave. It's my pleasure. Nice talking to you.
Aloha. This is Dave Windor from Monster Magnet, and you're listening to my good friend Dave Lawrence, that member-supported Hawaii Public Radio and All Things Considered. (laughs) 